Happy Father's Day to all the men and all the, uh, all the gentlemen in the room. I just want to speak to you for a moment. Whether you have had an earthly kid or not, I'm just going to say this. Today we're reading out of Romans chapter 8. The Apostle Paul did not have an earthly son or daughter, but he was an incredible spiritual father to so many. And so if you're here today and you don't have a, a, a son or a daughter in, in the way of the natural, um, I believe so strongly that today it is a happy Father's Day to you as a spiritual father in someone life and so I hope that you uh, feel included in our day today and um, so today we are going to keep um, in our series of Romans chapter 8 a series we've been in for the last two weeks I'll just go backwards for a moment if you weren't here you might need to go back and watch to catch up but week one we talked about justification which happened on the cross Jesus made us in right standing with God uh, Romans 8 verses 1 through 4 are all about justification uh, last week we talked about yeah, sanctification, which is becoming more like God. It's looking and, and living like Jesus. And today, we're going to talk through this um, idea of adoption. I, I believe so strongly that today is going to be a life-changing day for some people in this room. Because how you view God is not how the Bible portrays him. And how we view God many times is related to how we view our earthly father. And I don't know what your relationship is to your earthly father. Some of you, you've had incredible examples of what love looks like and what sacrifice and care looks like. And so, some other people, you would say, I don't know my earthly father or we didn't really have much of a relationship. And so sometimes we view God the same way that we view our earthly father. And today, I want to paint a clear picture from the Bible about who God is. But I'm going to start by asking you a question. Have you ever had someone tell you to act like it? I'll give you some examples of this, right? When I was a kid, we're a Van Schoonhoven, right? It's a, it's a proud name. It's a Dutch, it's a strong name, right? Not many have it. So, so our last name, Van Schoonhoven, uh, I'll just use an example. I remember one time we went... Um, Black Friday shopping with my grandmother, okay? This was a huge thing. We'd go to New York every Thanksgiving, and we'd all go Black Friday shopping. And this was back in, like, the mid to late 90s when, like, people were literally, like, beating each other up. And, well, it still kind of happens, but it, the online shopping has reduced this a little bit. But it was chaos at Walmart and stuff. I mean, people would literally lose their salvation over, like, a, a game of dominoes or something. But... So we would go, and I remember this one time, me and my cousins, we kind of ganged up on this little kid who had his hands around a box that we wanted to get. And so my grandma, she looks over and said, hey, right, startled you a little bit. Hey, we're Van Schoonhovens. We don't do that. You, you need to act like it. You need to act like you're a Van Schoonhoven. We don't do that. I remember when I was in Bible college, um, I was new to the faith, and um, th there were some attributes of, of my life that didn't resemble that of a, of a strong Christian who wanted to serve Jesus. And I remember one time we were at this church service and I was goofing off like way far past the line of where the line was of appropriate. I was about a mile past it. And so my director came up to me and he said, hey, w what are you doing? Like you say you want to serve God. You say you want to be a man of God. You say you want to lead people. Why don't you start to act like it. And so um, even as a father, like Sunday night football, I remember there was a really important Vikings Packer game. And I was, I was a new father and I was watching it and, and my son was going crazy. And my wife had been faithful to give me like five hours of watching football. And then it was the end of this game and I tried to pass him off and she's super tired. And in my head, I'm just like, okay, you chose this. <laughs> you chose to be a father. So now it's time to act like it. And so Paul is going to describe some things in Romans chapter 8. And I believe that this, this statement of act like it, um, this isn't behavior modification. Understand, this is not what I'm saying, okay? Because when you fall in love with Jesus, you're not going to try your best to do and don't. You're going to just naturally start to look like Jesus. And so when I say act like it, I want you to hear the heart of what I'm saying. When you know who you are and whose you are, you will start to look like and act like that. And so today we're going to talk about what it means to be a child of God. Today we're going to talk about the greatest father that has ever been represented in all of history, and his name is God. And I want to talk to you about him today. So Romans chapter 8, we'll start in verse 14. Here's what it says. It says, uh, Paul is speaking. He says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. 
The only way that you can be led by the Spirit of God is to be in relationship with Him through His Son, Jesus. So He is speaking to those who have placed their faith in Christ, that you are all led by the Spirit and you are children of God. You are, you are adopted. You are brothers and sisters. And therefore, because you are part of the family, you should act like it. And again, you're going to hear my heart here. It's not about do's and don'ts. But I want you to get this strong theme. When you know you're part of a family, you'll start to act like it. Verse 15 and 16. Paul says, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. Here's what Paul is addressing. In this first verse where he says, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. He knows their heritage. He knows the Jews had remembered that their, their ancestors were captive in slavery for 400 years. And some people, even once they came into acknowledgement of God... They would stay in this place of slavery. They would stay in this place of fear. Well, what if I just mess it up? Is God going to leave me? What, what if I'm not as far along as them? Is God going to abandon me? There was this constant fear, this slavery mentality that people were in. They didn't understand what it meant to be adopted. And, and, and I don't know if there's anyone in this room today, you... You literally went through the physical act of adoption. Maybe you've adopted or you were adopted. But there are few things on this planet that can rival the love that it would take to say, I want you. I, I, I want you and, and I, I don't know where you came from exactly and I don't know all about your bloodline and I don't know, I don't know what, your, what your sin nature is. I don't know any of those things. But as an adopted parent and say, I see past all that and I choose you. And so when I read this, I read about us being adopted as children. God didn't have to. He wanted to. It, it, it was his greatest joy to say, I, I know you've messed up. I, I know that we don't share the same bloodline of holiness, but I, I want you. I choose you. I say yes to you. And there are a few things on this planet. I am so in awe of people that can choose to adopt. Because it's so sacrificial. Because there's so many unknowns. There's so many, especially in our country, can we just do some work to make this a little easier to adopt? You shouldn't need $40,000 in five years. That's just my opinion. But I wish this was easier. But the people that say, hey, I'm going to choose to take someone that is not mine and I'm going to make them mine. There's few things more powerful than that. And so if you're not maybe in relationship with someone who has adopted or maybe you yourself, you don't have close relationship. I just want to show you a quick video real quick so that we can understand the power of what adoption means.
picture of, of our family. All of us would love for you to be the next picture and to be part of our family. Carter, would you like to be a tip for to be in a star drawing brother? There's nothing, you can turn the house lights back on, there's nothing in the entire world like being alone, being without a family, being without the covering of a mother and a father. There's nothing that could truly take that place until someone says, I choose you. I'll adopt you. And so today... I'll read verse 15 and 16 again. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. We're not, we're not there. We're not slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. There is nothing in the world like going from orphan to adopted. When you're an orphan, when you're a foster kid, you're always waiting. When can I finally settle down? When can I finally have roots? When can I finally have a family? When can I finally have stability? This is what an orphan or a foster kid thinks about every single day. And whether you knew it or not, you used to be a foster kid before you knew Jesus, before you were adopted into his family. You were always displaced and wondering, is anyone ever going to say yes to me? Is anyone ever going to claim me as theirs? And we learn through this text that this is exactly what Abba Father has done for us. And so today I want to teach one point. I'm going to use this word act and understand. I want to prove a point through this. This isn't behavior. I'm not trying to teach behavior. But today if we're going to go from orphan to adopted, number one, we need to act like a son or a daughter. Because you will act like the person that you think you are. You'll act like it. If you think that you're an orphan, you're going to act like an orphan as it relates to spiritual fatherhood. If you believe that, that you're part of God's family and you believe that there's a, a father that created everything and then he chose you, you're going to live your life differently. The, the way that you act, not to, not to get in God's good graces, but the way that you live your life is going to be reflective about who you think you are. Action is the acceptance of our adoption. Action is the acceptance and saying, I've heard it, and now I'm going to live like it. I'm going to live like I've been adopted. You see, the Jews, they were always constantly searching for freedom. And, and so what Paul is, is doing here, he's reminding them that they've been set free from slavery. I told you for 400 years they were slaves to the Egyptians, and, and, and they were freed from this. And Paul's reminding them of their heritage. Don't forget the God that freed you from slavery. You're not those people anymore. But then he's speaking to the Gentile. Because the Gentile didn't have that history. They didn't have that heritage. They were new. And Paul is saying, you have a family. You have a family that's waiting for you. And he uses this phrase in verse 15. He says, now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. This word, Abba, I want you to know what this word means. This is the most intimate way that you could say father. It'd be equivalent to daddy in our culture. When you see a grown woman call her dad, daddy, like there's nothing more endearing to a father, I'm sure. To, to, no matter how old you are, you're still daddy. That, that no one's like you. There's no one that can love you like a daddy can. And, and so when the Bible says, now we call him, you used to view God differently. God was just your provider. God was just your redeemer. God was just your rescuer. But now, but now we call him daddy God. Because he adopted us as children, because he said yes to us even at our worst. He said yes to us even in our disbelief. He said yes to us even when we said no to him. He still said yes. 
And for that, now he's not just our leader. We're not just limited to seeing the hand of God. Now we get the heart of God. It's not just what he could do for us. They knew God as a provider. God gave manna while they were in the desert wandering around for 40 years. God fed the Jews, the Israelites this way for 40 years. They knew he would provide for them. But they didn't know the relationship that they could have with him. So Paul is changing everything. He's saying what you know about God is so limited. Yes, he's your provider. Yes, he's your savior. Yes, he's your rescuer. But he's so much more than that. Today, God wants to be your provider and he wants to be your dad. Your father. So you get his manna and you get his relationship. I believe that when we come into the understanding of this, that the Father's perfect act of adoption, it must inspire our audacious approach to sonship or daughtership. When we understand that he chose us and he adopted us, then it has to do something in our soul. I read this, this quote, it's an unknown author, and here's what it says. It says, the only person that wakes up a king in the middle of the night for a glass of water is his child. See, if anyone else wakes up the king in the middle of the night and asks for a water, you know what happens? You get replaced <laughs> in title and in the afterlife. <laughs> in the culture they would be speaking into, you don't get the privilege. Only very few people get the ear of the king. But, but what happens when, when we realize that God is not only our king, but he's our father. And, that, and in fact, he invites us to come to him as children, even though he's a king. No one else can understand this relationship except for an adopted son or daughter of the king. You can't understand this unless you're in this relationship. And so we can approach God with anything. I believe this with all my heart. You can come to God and say, Daddy... In the middle of the night. Now God never sleeps. There's figurative parts of this. But you can go to God and say, Dad, my body hurts. My physical body is not right. God, would you heal me? God, would you heal my body? God, this depression that I keep going back to. God, would you take these thoughts from me? Would you replace them? Would you renew my mind? Would you renew me by transforming my mind? God, would you do this? Because when you have a dad that's also the king, you're not interrupting him when you come with audacious faith. God, I'm standing in place and saying, I'm going to break the generational curses that are in my family. I don't believe that there's divorce. I don't believe that there's infidelity. I don't believe that those things will exist past my family. You know why? Because I can go to my God, my dad. And I can say, God, I could never do this on my own. But God, would you do this in me? Would you do this through me? Because if you really are my daddy, I know I'm not bothering you. I, I know you're not annoyed by me. And some of us, this is how we interact with God. We don't talk to him because we think, here's some things that we think about God. We think he's not listening. He doesn't care about the things that are maybe small in the grand scheme of the world and eternity and all that. Our lives seem quite small. And so we think God's just probably not very interested in that. Maybe it's a, it's, a, it's a power issue. God can't really do what I'm asking him to do, so therefore I won't ask. This is the relationship that many of us, we, we, we stay in this stepdad relationship with God. Now there's some incredible stepdads, don't mishear what I'm saying, but a, a stepdad who doesn't really have an interest in the child. Right? A, a stepdad that's kind of just, I'll wait for him to graduate so they can go, I'm never really claiming them as mine. That, that's somehow how we view God. And we interact with God as some distant stepfather or some distant creator. We acknowledge his power of creation, but we don't acknowledge the relationship that he dies to have with us. And so in order to change this, to change our results, we have to change our approach. How do you approach God? How do you come to him? How do you pray to him? How, how do you view him? 
Because God is Abba, Father, not distant, created, creator, or angry father. Some of us, we have this very angry view of who God is. That he's just waiting for you to mess up and sin so he can convict you, so that he can push you out, so that he can take those adoption papers away. Because maybe that's what our earthly father did. Maybe our earthly father didn't have a lot of grace on us. And so we think God won't have grace on us. Maybe our our, our earthly father didn't listen to us very much. And so we went, hey, daddy, I want to tell you this. And the TV was more important than the son or the daughter. And so we view God this way. But if we're going to change our results as far as how we live our life, then we need to change our approach. What do you see when you look at yourself? Do you see a son or a daughter? Or do you see an orphan? Do you feel like you have a spiritual family? Do you feel like God is your daddy, father, God? Or do you view him as very distant? Hebrews chapter 4, the writer of Hebrews says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You don't need to come timidly to God. You don't need to have your sentences all worked out. You don't need to have your prayers perfectly aligned and the right wording and the right the grammar, all that stuff. Just come to God and just like a little kid, childlike faith and say, Daddy, not just I need you. Can I tell you something? The other day, uh, my son is two and a half years old and I- I've been telling him I love him forever because I just need him to repeat it back to me just because it gives me a reason to live. The other day, no joke, for the first time that I can remember, my kid, he runs up to me and he looks me square in the eyes and he says, Daddy, I love you. And it literally like broke me. And in the same way, in the same way, the fact that he wanted to tell me that he loved me, the fact that he felt safe enough to tell me that, knowing that I could receive it, In the same way, I kind of was challenging myself, is this how I come to God? Do I come to God just like, gimme, 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 I need, I need, I need? Or do sometimes I just come to God and, Dad, I love you. You're so good. Like, I I don't have all the money I thought I would, and maybe my health isn't quite where I thought it would be, and I got some relationship strain in my life, but, Dad, I love you. You're good. So how do we act like a son or a daughter? I'm going to give you some practical tips. There's eight things. You can write them down real quick. I'm going to breeze through them. But how do you act like a son or daughter? Number one, you do it with childlike faith. Audacious faith that believes that God can do anything. You know how your kid, at a certain age, at a certain age they figure out you're mortal and you cannot actually do everything. But there's a certain window between like four and nine or something that they truly believe that you can do anything. And so they'll ask you for ridiculous things. They'll ask you for things that don't even make sense. And so in the same way, if we want to act like a son or daughter, we're going to come to God with childlike faith. We say, God, I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know how it's possible, but your word says with men it will fail, but with God it cannot fail. And so, God, I'm going to take you up on that. I have childlike faith to believe that you are who you say you are. Number two, we do it with boldness, not bargains. When we come to God and we're going to boldly say, here's where I'm at, God. Here's the depravity. Here's the sin. Here's the disbelief. Here's the thing I'm trying to do all on my own, God. I'm just going to come to you boldly. I'm going to let you know exactly who I am as a person. I'm not going to try to make a bargain. God, if you do this, I'll do this. Because that's the nature That many times this is how we come to God, not as Abba, Father, Daddy, God, it's give me God. So we're not making bargains with God, we're coming with boldness. Number three, with a spirit of gratitude. What if all you had today was what you gave God thanks for yesterday? What if all you had today was what you gave God thanks for yesterday? Is that even a part of our relationship with God? Do we even have a, a, a mentality that I'm going to give God thanks for the things that I see and the things that maybe I don't see? God, I'm going I'm to give you praise and honor and gratitude because you're good. Number four, we do it with maturity, which is ownership. 
I take ownership of my life. I take ownership of my family. Men, we're called to lead our family. I'm going to own that. I'm not going to run from that. Ladies, it's not our fault that God told us to do that. <laughs> Give us some grace <laughs> in the process. We're trying. <laughs> we're not trying to lord and dominate. At least we shouldn't. Men, you should never try to dominate. We're in partnership. We're in union together. We're equal in all things. But God did call men to lead the house. So men, we need to own this. And what an incredible privilege to be able to see our kids become mature believers. To see our wife grow in her faith. We have to own it with maturity. Number five, we do it with confidence. You have been accepted before you had anything to offer. You need to know God is not listening to your prayers. God is not moving on your behalf because you got it all together. He's doing it because you're kids and he loves you. And so you don't have to have every gifting. Number six, we do it with obedience. One of the greatest gifts that we can give back to God is to obey what he said. And you know this as someone that was a child at one point or maybe you have children right now. What drives you the most nuts in your house? Usually when your kids are disobedient. When, when what you're telling them to do is good for them. It makes sense because you see it differently than your eight-year-old does. You can see why it's not just about a dirty room, it's about mold infesting your clothing if you don't wash it. <laughs> and then you're going to get sick. <laughs> and and the, the, that one dirty pair of jeans, if we just deal with this early on, if you just pick up your clothes and take them to the laundry, right? These are things as parents, we get it. And in the same way with God, sometimes he's just like, I know you. I know it doesn't make sense to you, but I gave you my word as a blueprint how to live your life. And if you would trust me and just obey, even when it doesn't feel right, right? We live in a culture where we're so bent on if it doesn't give me an emotional high, and if I don't have a feeling of, of, of que you know, softness towards everything God says, then I don't have to do it. But what if we were to start to obey? Number seven, we do it, we act like a son or daughter with open hands. We have a posture of not just give me, but God, what can I give to you? God, what praise is due to you? How can I be generous with my time, talent, and treasure so that people on this earth would know you? How can I give that back to you? And number eight, we do it with trust, not fear. Trusting that he is daddy. And there was nothing he would do to purposely hurt you ever. Ever, ever, ever. It's not even his nature. He doesn't know how to hurt you. You need to know that about daddy God. He doesn't know how to do it. He couldn't do it because <laughs> it's not in his nature to hurt you. That doesn't mean we're not going to have difficult seasons. That doesn't mean that we're not going to have hard choices to make. And suffering is different than hurt. And, and I'm going to explain that in just a moment because the text brings something out that we need to acknowledge today. Stop expecting the least out of your life and start anticipating that God wants to do the most through your life. This is a shift for us. Let's move on to verse 17 and 18. Paul says, and since we are his children, since we've been adopted, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share in his glory, we must also share his suffering. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. Paul takes adoption to the next level. Because you know what it means to be an heir? Now, that's not really in our culture, but like in England, Prince William, right? He is an heir to the throne. Because of his birth, right, and because of where he was born in history and, and all those factors that came into place, it made him an heir to the throne. And do you know that every single one of you, if you are a child of God, you are an heir with Christ? That you've been given the keys to the kingdom? Do you know that? Because sometimes we don't live like that. We live like we're peasants on the outside looking at God and his majesty and his throne. And, and we, we, we are on the outside of it looking in and saying, wow, that would be nice. If I was just as blessed as them. If I was just as financially stable as them. If I was just as pretty as them. We do all these things that we create a boundary between us as heirs. But we are princes and princesses. We are heirs with Christ. 
And your inheritance is due to your heritage. You know why you're an heir? Because you're a child of God. That's the only reason. It's nothing you ever did. You weren't convincing enough to make God uh, make that decision over your life. You know what? I'm going to make them an heir. I'm going to make them more important. You didn't do anything like that. But because of your heritage, God said, you're an heir. An heir doesn't need to earn anything. Everything they need is secured simply because they are an heir. You need to know that. There's nothing you need to work for. God's already done it. He's already said yes to you. He already adopted you. So we see this part of heirs with Christ. But then in the back part of this verse, it says, provided that we suffer with Christ. Here's what Paul's saying, that while we suffer, we're not going to suffer alone because we're co-heirs. And because we're in this together, and because now we're in perfect unity with Jesus, we don't suffer alone. But I need something to be clear here today because it's easy to stop that verse that we're co-heirs with Christ. I've heard that a million times. I've prayed it. I've used it as an exclamation point to to help boost and motivate people. Hey, we're co-heirs with Christ. Provided that we suffer with him. I've left that part of the verse out. I'm guilty of that. What does this mean to suffer for Christ? It means in the same way that Jesus said, hey, they hated me, they're going to hate you. Not taking everything so personally. When people do not receive us and the Jesus we have in us, we take that so personal sometimes. Here's what I would say is that's part of the suffering with Christ. You're going to have to just come to the conclusion that not everyone is going to embrace your Jesus. It may come in the form of God will allow you to go through a difficult season of life. Many of the times when Paul was in prison, um, it wasn't because he did anything wrong. It was because God allowed him to go into prison because it was part of his purpose for that season. But that was suffering. The whole book of Philippians, Paul is chained to a Roman guard. And he's writing the most joyful book the Bible has. Why? Because he knew that in order to be in perfect relationship and a co-heir with Christ, he'd have to suffer with him. So today, I would just say this. Don't take your suffering personally. Now, some of it we we induce on ourselves, and that's the truth. Sometimes we make really stupid decisions, and we try to bring God into that. Well, God just allowed me to suffer. No, you should probably pay your bills instead of, like, gambling. Like, that might be a decent thing to do. Or... You know, sometimes we do very irrational things and try to bring God into our dysfunction and put it as part of our mission and purpose, right? That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is you're in relationship with Jesus. You come to the place, I am a son or a daughter. I'm walking in my adoption. But this is hard. This is difficult. This is not what I thought it would be. You're probably right in the perfect spot. And God's probably doing exactly what he planned to do. Ignitus of Lyons, he said, I'm going to put this quote up. He said, people aren't often persuaded into believing the gospel. It's only when they see how much you suffer that they believe. You know, many times it's, we can talk about the goodness of God all the time, but until people see us go through a difficult season where our car breaks down and we don't have money for the things we thought he would and our kids are going crazy and our marriage is going through a difficult season. But the way that we keep our eyes on Jesus, the way that we have joy in the midst of those difficult things. Do you know the message that sends to the world? Do you know the message that sends to your coworkers? Many times when we suffer, it's actually an incredible mission ground for the people around us to see Jesus in us in the midst of high level hurt and pain. Because the suffering is not hollow. We're doing it for a purpose. You can suffer for a purpose. Verse 19. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Here's what Paul's saying. All creation's waiting. Creation is anticipating Jesus coming back. And when God is going to reveal... Who his real children are. And if you're in this room today and you place your faith in Christ, this is talking about you. The whole creation anticipates the day. In Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to finish with this verse. Jesus said in the same way, 
Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. All creation's waiting. All creation is looking and waiting to see who Jesus really is. And you know how they're going to see who Jesus really is? Through you and me. Through the way that we act like sons and daughters. And this isn't, this isn't about being fake. This isn't about doing something out of rituals and doing do's and don'ts. This is about embracing your heritage. You are a son and you are a daughter of God. And I hope you know today that there is nothing more powerful than coming underneath that and saying, now I have the covering of a father and a king. Those aren't separate things, but today I now have the full authority that comes from a king, but I have the full love and, and, and acknowledgement that comes from a daddy. This should change the way that we view God. And I don't know how you came in here today. I don't know what your view of God has been. I don't know if your view of God has been distant. I don't know if your view of God has been very religious. If you pray at certain times in the day, before meals, at night, and you kind of just give God a few sentences every day, then that's our prayer life. Can I tell you, a daddy is so much more than that. And the way that my son can just sit there and have conversations with me and I pick up every like sixth word he says and I piece them together and I get an understanding of what he's saying. Do you know, I don't need him to say it perfectly. I just want him to talk to me so I can learn more about him, learn how he's thinking, learn how he's processing. And then every once in a while when he pops those, I love you, daddy, when he pops those things in there, it literally melts my heart. And I want you to know in the same way, you absolutely melt God's heart. When you talk to him like a daddy, when you talk to him in the way that you would in your most loving view of a father, when you communicate with him, when you interact with God in that way, there is nothing more intimate on this planet than that kind of relationship with God. In, in husband and wife, like it's supposed to resemble that, but nothing can even get close to that relationship between a son or a daughter and daddy God. And so today, are you living like an orphan? Or are you living like you've been chosen, you've been adopted? Are you acting like a stepson? Or are you acting like a son? Are you acting like a foster child? And I'm not making light of any of those. Please hear my heart. Or are you acting like an adopted son? Let's pray. Jesus, I just... Um, I come to you right now, Lord, and I just, um, I thank you that you said yes to me. I gave you every reason to say no. I've rejected you so many times. I've spent more of my life in rebellion towards you than I have serving you. And still, God, you would say that you have a future and a hope for me. You'd still say that I choose you as son. I first just start by giving you thanks. God, I want to come with a heart of gratitude. I don't want to ask you for anything, God. I just want to thank you. Would we just spend just a moment in reflection, God, thank you. I thank you for choosing me. I thank you for saying yes to me. I thank you that you made me a son and a daughter. But today, God, I don't want to just know it. I don't want to just hear it. I want to start to live that way. Because when I know that I have a daddy who's not looking to discipline me at every moment, who's not looking to give me away, that isn't committed to me. If that's what I view about God, I'm never going to embrace my sonship. So today, God, by your Holy Spirit alone, God, would you intertwine your spirit with ours? Would we give up this slavery mentality that we stay in? We just believe we're hired hands, we're just workers, we're we're just doing the work. It's not what you've done. That's not who we are. God, I pray that there would be a deep yearning for relationship. In the way that a child wants to be with their dad. God, I pray that we would yearn to be with you that way. God, I pray right now that you would forgive us of maybe the way we viewed you. 
Maybe we haven't had that view of you. We've never interacted with you as daddy. We've interacted with you as distant, far off creator. God, would you forgive us of that? But God, would you draw near to us so that we can feel your presence, so that we can feel the love of a father? I just believe today that before someone leaves, you just, God wants to spiritually just give you a massive bear hug that only a dad can give. And just say, I love you, I chose you, I adopted you. Even when you didn't know me, even when you didn't love me, even when you were in rebellion towards me, I still said yes to you. And I still say yes to you today. God wants to remind someone of that today, that you're a son, you're a daughter. There's nothing you could ever do that God would kick you out of the family. So God, I just pray over this next moment as we worship together. God, I pray that we would just spend a moment We'd sing to you like a small child would talk to a dad. We'll believe that you are the God of the universe, that you can do all things, that nothing is impossible for you. And God, I just pray for the person in this room today that maybe came here and they don't know you. They didn't know you as distant God. They didn't know you as creator. They didn't know you as Abba. They didn't know you at all. And today they say, I don't want to leave here fatherless. I want to leave here knowing that I have a dad in heaven who sacrificed his son for me, who gave up everything so that I could experience true freedom. That's you today before you leave. Let's pray. Let's talk about what it means to follow after Jesus. But God, let's just spend a moment. Let's just spend 60 seconds in your seat before you stand up to worship as we close. And just in your soul, you don't have to do it out loud. In your soul, just talk to God. Daddy, here's where I am. Here's who I am. Not what, you, what I need you to do, but just talk to Abba Father for just a moment and we'll close in worship.